Um, so next up, we have Daniel Kochaz, who is, oh, you're up here, uh, who is Global Head of Business Development at Chainlink, and he will be talking about decentralized oracles. Cool. Hi, everyone. Thanks for showing up today uh, and taking some interest in Chainlink and what we're building. Um, we're going to be talking about decentralized oracles and sort of their intersection with trusted execution environments um, to sort of set the stage of uh, sort of the oracle problem and what exactly it is. That's... Having some issues with the slides here. Oh, there we go. Cool. So <clears throat> with the current state of smart contracts, uh, there's a connectivity issue that they have. Um, natively, they can't communicate with off-chain um, endpoints, APIs, and payment systems. And with uh, sort of the advent of Ethereum and all the different use cases that we've been able to approach with uh, the scriptable smart contracts that uh, Ethereum's provided us, you know, we really need to access those different data points and payment systems for smart contracts to have uh, meaningful events in the, in the real world. And so the way we approach that and solving that problem is through um, blockchain middleware. Doesn't sound that sexy, but uh, it is what it is. And what that middleware does is that it sits between where the smart contract code executes and then those off-chain um, endpoints and payment systems. Um, the other thing that it allows is for uh, cross-chain communication um, between different blockchain protocols. And so when you're writing these smart contracts, um, what you want to consider is end-to-end -end reliability. So you've got this uh, deterministic, um, immutable um, record for smart contracts. They're going to execute as they should as long as they have the uh, inputs that they need to execute. And so it doesn't really make sense for them to be you know, completely decentralized, hosted on thousands of nodes, and then it's relying upon um, a single uh, data point or node um, for someone to take out. So what you don't want to do is have a centralized oracle um, that someone could come and attack as a single attack vector. Um, what you really want to do, and this is our approach here, um, there's a few levels of uh, decentralization that we bring to the game. Um, one's at the, uh, the, the node operator level. So let's say you've got a smart contract that needs a, a single endpoint or data point, let's call it the price of some cryptocurrency. You could have multiple independent third-party node operators query a single endpoint, let's say you, like, you really like CoinMarketCap for some reason, and then have them do a, a commit reveal scheme and aggregate that data on chain. If it's all the same, then you can feed that into the smart contract. But you can take the decentralization a bit further. Um, you could have multiple data providers that are independent. So let's say, you know, CoinMarketCap, CryptoCompare, Brave New Coin, there's a ton of them. And then you could layer in the decentralization of the node operators um, on top of that. So you're getting decentralization at the data level and then decentralization um, from the node operators themselves. Um, so a real world example of this, um, you've got a, a delivery for goods smart contract. Um, you, you can actually, uh, some of the, the nodes, and sorry, the oracles that I've been talking about are actually live on our site. Um, if you go to docs.chain.link, you can see them there. Um, so EasyPost is a carrier tracking API. So you have to track where a good's being delivered. So upon um, delivery, you know, you can feed that um, confirmation into a smart contract. And then you could have uh, a redundant data feed for that as well, which is where like flight stats could come in. Um, most of the smart contracts in the, in the world today are still denominated in fiat. Um, however, they're being settled in a cryptocurrency. So um, in lines with the example that I was just talking about with the different um, sources for cryptocurrency to make sure you have the right exchange rate, you're going to need that to calculate how much cryptocurrency to transfer between the, uh, the smart contract parties um, when something, you know, let's say it's a thousand bucks for delivery, you need to know how much um, ETH to send, so you need to know the value of ETH. Um, so the ultimate goal of our body of work is to create um, hundreds and hundreds of these nodes um, and to make it really simple for smart contract developers to come in 
and um, essentially build stuff the way that we've traditionally been building things. For instance, let's say if you were trying to build Uber, if you were to try to build that full stack, you'd have to build your own GPS system, text MS, uh, SMS, uh, payment system, and it'd be a much more complicated process than coming in, just writing your core code, and then connecting to an SMS API, a GPS API, a payment gateway. Um, it makes things much easier. And so that's where we come in. We want you to be able to build really meaningful smart contracts. And so come in, we've got hundreds of different data points and payment systems that you can integrate with. Um, if there's something that you want, it's really easy to come to, come to me or anyone on the team and we can get them spun up. Um, so, so far, this is sort of uh, the, the software approach that we have. And so the, the next uh, layer of what we can do, um, we sort of call it a, a depth of defense approach, is adding in trusted execution environments. Um, with them, um, you've got sort of these uh, independent um, computation enclaves where you can have a bunch of uh, code operating in there, smart contracts can operate in there. And we've been working with uh, Cornell and IC3 where we have um, acquired Town Crier in October of last year, and we're taking over the project. It's been developed by uh, Ari Jules, um, who was former chief scientist of RSA, and uh, a lot of other very smart academics. Um, we're running it on Intel SGX. Um, from talking to those academics, um, you know, there's a, there's a few different trusted execution environments out there, but uh, everyone's been banging on SGX the most, and that's the one that we've chose to go with. Um, one, because it works. Um, it's been in production for nearly two years, providing data for uh, the gas token. And then, um, you know, here's sort of a, a, an approach to the approach of Town Crier and some of the benefits of it. So, you know, a current attack surface today, someone could come in and look at sort of the, the hypervisor or OS level. Um, however, with these new TEEs, um, it minimizes that and the attack surface is much smaller than it traditionally has been. And so just to take a look at it, um, it works pretty much like a current smart contract does. You've got a, a user requesting contract that talks to the town crier contract. Um, you then have uh, smart contract code running in an enclave. Um, there could be a few different options of what's in there. I'll go into a few. Um, but in this one, um, it's talking to lots of data.com and talking about a bunch of data points. And then it feeds that back into the smart contract. Mm. Oh, whoops. So there's um, a few different levels of confidentiality that you get using these trusted execution environments. Um, you've got no one can actually access what's going in on them, going on in them. So you've got multiple independent third parties operating these nodes. They don't actually know what's going on in those enclaves. So everything's private. Um, this is really good for managing uh, credentials for payments. You know, um, those credentials are essentially worth whatever's in that, uh, like payment for that smart contract or like your bank account. So it's great to have them confidential. And then uh, you also can control your private keys in there for um, signing transactions across chains. And then uh, moving along, we've got private smart contract code execution off chain um, along with um, smell, sorry, scalable smart contract code execution on chain. So there's um, sort of a good example here would be threshold calculations. Um, let's say you've got a smart contract that's an option or derivative with the underlying asset being uh, cryptocurrency. Um, so it's going to be really inefficient and costly to continually send the price of that underlying asset on chain. Let's say you want to trade um, ETH when it hits 200 bucks. You know, sending that on chain every minute is going to add up. So you can actually have that code running within the trusted execution environment, pinging those off-chain endpoints, and you don't have to worry about those gas costs. So once it hits 200 bucks, it'll send it on chain. And so the, uh, the, the private part about that that's really good, and I think it's been talked about a few times, is a, a front running. Um, so you know, if you've got an eight-figure smart contract for this derivative, um, you don't want people to front run it. You can actually have that code running in there, and as opposed to sending, oh yeah, uh, 200 bucks on chain to the, the smart contract to execute, you can just send a binary result on chain. Um, so no one knows what that threshold point is for your, uh, for your derivative. 
Um, other thing, so it's not just so, uh, some other computation that can happen in there. Um, you know, you can have trusted libraries execute in there. Um, given that a good chunk of the mainnet traffic currently um, is uh, lottery contracts, I can just go through a quick example of that. So you've got that lottery contract there with uh, the blockchain middleware or Chainlink or an Oracle operating there with the trusted execution environment. Um, you can have you know, a tested randomness library that's operating within that SGX enclave, and then it can send that data back on chain um, into your smart contract. So combining that with the, the software level of decentralization that I was talking about with the multiple independent node operators, and then the different data sources or you know, computation running in those enclaves, you start to get a, a more reliable um, decentralized uh, Oracle network. And so just sort of to summarize that, you know, I was talking about end-to-end -end reliability earlier. You know, if you don't have that reliability all the way through the data source and origin, through payment, you know, it doesn't matter how decentralized or uh, deterministic your smart contract code is if you've got those weaknesses. And then, um, you know, really the ultimate body of our work, which is what I was talking about before, is creating all these different chain link oracles and nodes to make it really easy for developers to come in. We're actually focused on you, you're our end user. Um, we want you to build meaningful smart contracts, you know, that have real world events um, triggering them and having meaningful outputs. And then uh, if you want to check out some of the oracles that are currently live, you can go to docs.chain.link. Um, and they're all listed there, and feel free to find me um, after the conference if you've got any questions. Thank you. <laughs>